You don't need me to tell you how devastating a fire can be, especially if that fire is on board an aeroplane. For example, if your house was on fire, you can escape. If you are traveling on an airplane and an uncontrollable fire breaks out, you have nowhere to go. You are at the mercy of the skill of the pilots and the clock to ensure your survival. Some of the most horrific air disasters that have ever occurred have involved in-flight fires. Perhaps amongst the most devastating and terrifying cases in this category is the disaster we're discussing today. The era of history we know as the Cold War, a lot of images probably spring to mind. The city of Berlin, today the German capital, was pretty much at the epicenter of a division between East and West. The city itself was divided in two, the west side of the city an exclave of West Germany within the East. A wall separated the two. This split was in part a result from the events of the Second World War. After the war, the Soviet Union occupied the eastern half of the city, and indeed, East Germany as a whole, aside from West Berlin. The Soviet Union wanted to expand their sphere of influence. East Germany became a puppet state like other countries in Eastern Europe. East Germany, for this era of history, was a separate country from the rest of Germany. It had all the things you'd expect a different country to have. Its own government, its own infrastructure, its own currency, and of course, to lead onto today's topic, its own airline. The East German airline was called Interflight, or in German, Interflug. Interflug operated between the years of 1958 and 1991, and were based out of what was known at the time as Berlin Schonefeld Airport. As East Germany was under the influence of the Soviet Union, the aircraft they flew were Czech, Russian, and Ukrainian made. The Soviet Union throughout the 1950s and 1960s, much like other countries, were developing their own aviation technology as things transitioned into the jet age. In 1963, the Soviet Union unveiled what was, at the time, the largest passenger plane ever made, a four-rear-mounted engine jetliner called the Aleutian IL-62. It was, in fact, one of only two planes to feature this configuration of engine and tail structure, the other being the Vickers VC-10. For its time, this was a huge plane. Though it was a narrow-body jetliner, it was quite long, standing at over 53 meters in length. The plane could carry close to 200 passengers with a range of 6,000 miles, making it the ideal plane for long-range flights for carriers in the east. 292 of these Soviet airliners were built. Many were flown for Aeroflot, but many were also in the hands of air carriers across the Soviet world. Air Koryo of North Korea supposedly still has two of these planes in passenger service today. Needless to say that Interflug also operated the plane in its time. They started receiving their IL-62s in 1970, and their first Aleutian jet was Delta Mike Sierra Echo Alpha, the accident aircraft. The plane would operate for little over two years before its deadly fate. Which brings us to August 14th, 1972. It was a Monday, also a very warm summer's day in Berlin. This Aleutian IL-62 was sitting on the ground at Berlin Schonefeld Airport. It had just arrived in from a flight from Moscow, and preparations were being made for a journey that afternoon down to Burgas in Bulgaria. One thing to highlight before we go further is in relation to the accident flight's flight number. Most sources do not seem to include this information. That could be because in this specific case, this rather simple piece of information seems to be a bit conflicting. One source, an old German documentary, did mention that the flight number was 450-450. Though I have no reason to suspect this is false, I have also seen multiple people reference a flight number of 742. The thing is, regardless, I was not able to cross-reference this information with other written sources. So for the sake of this video, the plane will be referred to by an abbreviated version of its registration, Echo Alpha. The IL-62 required a total of four pilots to fly. 51-year-old Captain Heinz Pfaff was one of the most experienced pilots around flying the Aleutian. By the time of the disaster, he had acquired over 8,000 flight hours. Sat next to him was his co-pilot, 35-year-old Lothar Walther, an experienced pilot in his own right with over 6,000 hours logged. 
also on board was a flight engineer in Golfstein, aged 32. Finally, there was the navigator, 38-year-old Akim Falenius. Interestingly, the navigator was a man who was involved in another interflug aviation incident in 1963, a non-fatal incident which was the result of a malfunctioning landing gear forcing a belly landing. The flight to Burgas was carrying primarily East German holidaymakers to the sunny Bulgarian coast. 148 passengers boarded the flight, with a further four flight attendants in the cabin for a total of 156 people on board. Down below, ground handlers were loading passenger luggage into the cargo compartments, but this wasn't the only thing being loaded onto the plane. Among the miscellaneous items in the cargo, de-icing fluid was stored at the very rear of the aircraft in compartment number four. Leaving the gate in Berlin, Echo Alpha took to the skies at just before 4.30 in the afternoon on August 14, 1972. In just a few hours, the plane would be in Bulgaria. Captain Pfaff was at the flight controls of the massive Aleutian jet. The first 13 minutes or so of the flight as the plane climbed were completely normal. The first sign of trouble for the pilots was first reported at 4.43. The aircraft was climbing through 29,000 feet, or in meters as the pilots would have been using, 8,900 meters. The pilots had noticed an issue with the plane's elevator trim function. Trim on aircraft allows a pilot to adjust small tabs on flight control surfaces. Trim can be used to apply a certain level of deflection force on, say, the elevators in this case, to help maintain a desired pitch. It can make controlling a plane a lot easier and pretty much every plane has elevator pitch trim. In fact, the art of trimming is one of the first things new pilots are taught to do in flying school. The pilots of our interflug flight had noticed the pitch trim was unresponsive. In attempting to troubleshoot the problem, the plane's course deviated 10 degrees to the east. Without further context, this alone was not cause for distress, but urgent enough that the pilots deemed it was necessary to return to Berlin. So at this point, the pilots began to turn their plane around and communicated with controllers about their situation. The thing is, the pilots in this moment had no idea how bad of a situation had just surfaced. To them, they thought they had trim failure. Out of sight in the back of the plane, it was a completely different story. Let's back up. We need to talk a bit more about the design of the Aleutian IL-62. As previously mentioned, this is a pretty long aircraft. Like almost every other plane you have likely ever been on, the passenger cabin is pressurized with the comfortable cabin atmosphere sealed inside an airtight chamber. But there was additional space on the IL-62 behind the cabin in a void space, an unpressurized chamber not visible to the passengers or even flight attendants. Many electrical cables ran through this void space, Everything from cables relating to the cabin lighting to the coffee machines used by the flight attendants. Also back here were critical lines relating to the aircraft's flight controls. But there was still even more in this space than the plane's electrics. The tail section is where all four of the plane's engines are located. When the plane was designed, it was decided that to connect hot air from the engines to the aircraft's air conditioning system, they would use that same space behind the cabin to transport hot air. The air coming through here from the engines reached temperatures around 300 degrees Celsius. So what happened on this flight is that a leak had occurred in these hot air tubes within the space in the rear of the plane. It's believed the leak was going on for considerable time before things got critical. At temperatures around 300 degrees, the heat weakened the insulation of the nearby electrical wiring. Once the internal wiring was exposed, a catastrophic electrical failure occurred. Short-circuiting created superheated arcing events. Reports suggest that the temperature of this arcing reached around 2,000 degrees Celsius. For reference, lava or magma, that is, liquid rock from volcanoes, ranges in the region a little over half of that temperature. 2,000 degrees is also a little under halfway to the temperature of the surface of the sun. Sparks with a temperature in the region of 2,000 degrees ignited the magnesium alloys of the aircraft structure. Such arcing was believed to have also occurred in the lower cargo deck, 
a fire erupted in the tail and cargo sections of the aircraft. The one thing that was not fitted in the space was smoke or fire detection equipment. So out of sight, an inferno was allowed to consume the tail section of the plane. The pilots had no idea this was even happening just yet. As the fire consumed the tail section of the plane, it began to spread. Smoke poured into the passenger cabin. As the inferno spiraled even more out of control, it began to affect the aircraft's flight controls, which was probably when the pilots first noticed an issue. The flight controls pertaining to the elevator were being destroyed by the fire. As smoke poured into the cabin, the flight attendants made the situation known to the pilots. By this point, the time was 4.51, and the plane was heading northbound back to Berlin. Several minutes had passed since the pilots first reported what they thought was a flight control issue to the ground. They were now dumping fuel to prevent an overweight landing. A mayday distress call was not issued at this time. The pilots were likely still not aware of how bad the situation was or was about to get. The fire in the tail section was believed to have made its way to where the de-icing fluid was stored in the cargo hold. The de-icing fluid loaded in this compartment was highly flammable. Aviation de-icing fluid, according to the FAA, has a flash point of around 65 degrees Celsius, or 150 degrees Fahrenheit. The de-icing fluid was now acting as a fuel for the fire. We don't have a whole lot of information about what happened on board the plane over the next few minutes. To my knowledge, there was no recorded flight data. I couldn't find any indication as to whether this plane had any flight recorders to begin with. It is likely that the fire entered the rear passenger cabin, burning away the cabin flooring, seating, luggage compartments, and galley and lavatories. The inferno was raging at such a high temperature it began to melt and destroy the aircraft's skin. Captain Pfaff, as the time went on, would have experienced increasing difficulty in controlling his aircraft. Multiple turns were made as the plane descended. They were progressively losing control. 4.59, less than one minute to impact with the ground. Only now did the pilots send out a distress call. They reported flight control problems, an onboard fire, and that they were beginning an emergency descent. As the pilots fought for control of the plane, the fire had eaten its way through the structural integrity of the aircraft to a critical point. The tail section of the plane broke away from the fuselage. From this moment, the plane was completely unflyable. The pilots and all 156 people on board never stood a chance. At this time, the jet was flying over the town of Königs-Wusterhausen, just a few miles south of Berlin. Bystanders on the ground later noted debris falling from the sky, parts of the plane, luggage, and people falling to the ground through the opening in the aircraft. According to a German newspaper, the aircraft was only a few hundred meters above the ground as the plane roared over the town. The remains of the massive jet entered an uncontrollable nosedive. In the final descent, the fuselage experienced excessive structural stress and part of the front fuselage was ripped from the plane. Seconds later, at just after 5 p.m., what was left of the plane crashed into a wooded area in the town of Königs just six miles south of Berlin Schoenfeld. Everyone died. If they had just a few more minutes, it might have been possible that they could have made it to the airport although there is no telling how the plane may have behaved during that final turn. The aircraft in such a poor structural state may have broken apart then. The Interflug disaster was, and still is to this day, the worst air disaster in German history. The horrific nature of the crash prompted immediate action, and Interflug's IL-62s were temporarily grounded. Following an investigation, the critical design flaw in the tail of the aircraft was noticed. The findings of the investigation were relayed back to the Soviet Union, and Aleutian 62 planes were to be retrofitted with a revised design, and all further manufactured planes of the type were going to reflect these changes. The changes included additional fire detection and prevention equipment in the offending space. A small window was added at the rear of the cabin, so one can physically observe with their own eyes what was going on back there. Recommendations suggested periodic physical inspections of the space for damage. Because this accident involved a Soviet airliner, the investigation into this disaster certainly wasn't without its fair share of Soviet shenanigans. The plane's manufacturer, Aleutian, despite making the aforementioned changes, 
never considered there was a problem with the IL-62's design. The Soviet establishment was not willing to admit that there were technical shortcomings in their aircraft, and only quietly implemented those changes in time. The Soviet Union kept quiet about the crash. The truth behind the disaster and what we know today was only uncovered following the reunification of Germany. For what it's worth, there were no accidents of this nature involving the IL-62 ever again. The plane has largely been retired from passenger service, with the previously mentioned Air Koryo holding onto their aircraft, and some do still remain in government, military, and freighter roles today. Some of Interflug's own IL-62s actually survived the test of time and are now on display, including this plane in Leipzig, which is now actually being converted into a restaurant. Hello everyone, thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to be subscribed as there will be another video coming next Saturday. I was really happy with how this one turned out. Sources were a bit limited as an English speaker myself. This video certainly wouldn't be the same without modern text translation, that's for sure. German sources had so much more information. Anyway, it is that time of the week where I must take a moment to thank my amazing patrons over on Patreon for their ongoing support to the channel. Their names are scrolling on the screen right now. A massive thanks if you see yourself on this list. Thank you so much. Shout out this week to Jennifer Fricadic, who actually increased their pledge this week. That is honestly much appreciated. Thank you so much. If you yourself would like to support the channel further and even get your name featured here at the end of the next video, you can join the Disaster Breakdown Patreon from just £1 per month, and the link to that will be in the pinned comment below. All patrons get early access to all new content two days before it goes out publicly on YouTube. I'm going to keep this outro rather short, so that is it from me this week. If you would like to connect with me, you can always follow me on my personal Twitter page, and that too will be in the pinned comment. Thank you so much for watching, have a great weekend, and I will see you next week. Goodbye!